All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the fifth installment in the 2019 ArborJet Winter Webinar Training Series. Uh, today we are going to cover tree physiology. So we'll cover soil and roots, trunk and arbor plug site selection, trunk tissues, arbor plug placement, xylem, xylem types relative to transport, the leaf and canopy, water movement in trees, tree response to injection, and factors affecting uptake. Uh, you'll probably see a few repeat slides from last week's arbor plug lecture, uh, but between that one and this class, I find these two to be the most important when it comes to understanding trunk injection, the arbor jet methodology, and, and how to be most efficient with your day out injecting. So more of a visual look, we'll start, we're going to start at the ground and work soil into the roots, through our trunk tissues, uh, axial and leaf transport, transpiration, and the canopy. So first thing to understand, plants, trees in general, need water to survive. Um, the way transpiration works is it, it, it tries to balance out bringing water and nutrients in through the roots and bringing that, those water and nutrients up to the leaf tissue to process into sugars and letting, uh, excess, letting, letting the excess gas, including water vapor, out of the leaf tissue, uh, including water vapor and oxygen. Uh, so the whole, uh, the whole point of transpiration uh, and using transpiration to move product up from up into the tree from your injection sites is based on your transpiration rates. So starting off with soil and roots. Uh, so soil is more than just a bunch of dirt put together. Uh, it's got a pH uh, that can rain, uh, widely range. Uh, it's where all your nutrients and minerals are going to be available to the trees. Uh, root system. You can see that uh, the the graph of your macronutrients and micronutrients from all uh, nitrogen and phosphorus all the way down to the boron, copper, and zinc, molybdenum. That's all based on your pH levels in the soil, um, and these being available allow the tree to be healthy. Uh, they dissolve into water or are carried into the roots through water mainly. Uh, a couple of these are actually brought in through citric acid, which the root can produce and excrete to dissolve and pull in. Uh, but most of these are, are available based on uh, water content in the soil and pH of the soil. So where these are thicker, that is where they, uh, that is the range of pH that they are most widely available at. Uh, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all the, all the macronutrients uh, range from anywhere from about 6 up to, up to 7 or 8, uh, just because that's where they bind least to the soil. Um, on the other side where you have your micronutrients like iron, manganese, boron, uh, most of those tend to range a little bit lower, so right around the, the 5.5, 5, up to 7. So typically between five and a half and seven is where you're going to find your best range of pH for overall nutrient availability. Um, that's important because again, that's how your plant brings in what it needs to stay healthy, which in turn causes uh, a healthy plant, which is what increases your transpiration rates. Uh, along with that, there needs to be adequate soil moisture to carry the ones that are soluble uh, to the root zone uh, and over to the root. Um, so a, an adequate soil moisture level uh, is also required for transpiration. Uh, if your soil is saturated, like you absolutely can't put any more water in it, so if you see standing water around, uh, typically that means your tree is also going to be full of water and doesn't need to actively absorb any water from the root zone. 
So it's not actively translocating anything either. It needs to have stuff constantly moving up through the xylem tissue, out through the canopy to want to bring in more and move stuff up. So if it's already full, uh, it's going to want to take a nap, kind of like everybody after the, a big Thanksgiving meal. Conversely, on a day where you haven't seen rain or the tree hasn't seen water for two to three weeks and it's, and it's starting to go into drought stress, uh, the canopy actually shuts down. We'll get a little bit more into how it does that later. Uh, it shuts down to not lose any more water. So that means it's capping off the top of the, the exit hole. So now nothing can come in because nothing can get out. It's got to work in this cycle. So moist soil, a good root zone. Uh, for trees, mostly the root zone uh, is within the top three to five feet of your soil layer. Um, there are some trees that have tap roots that head kind of down, that head down basically straight out of the trunk, give it a lot of support. But mainly all the roots that matter for water and nutrient uptake are within two to three feet of the soil, maybe five feet, depending on what your, uh, what type of tree and how loosely compacted your soil is, how easily the tree can, can, can grow roots through it. Uh, those roots will not only be uh, the about the diameter of the canopy, but most of the time, uh, if they have the space, they'll grow out much larger and much more larger of a radius than the canopy as well. So that's why when you see city trees or um, trees and sidewalks, trees next to driveways, uh, those have compromised root zones. Those are trees that, that mostly take uh, more effort or a longer time to get product in because they don't have uh, the ability to bring in product or bring in nutrients and water as fast. So they're translocating it more slowly, which means your products can have a slower time getting into the tree. So a key point from up to this is that available water, uh, soil temperature, and soil pH are critical for nutrients and uptake. By soil temperature, um, Kind of like a, a bear, when it gets cold, uh, the tree's going to also want to go to sleep. Uh, cold also makes it harder for water to move. Uh, so when your soil is below about 45 degrees, all those nutrients and water become pretty unavailable to the root. The root kind of wants to shut down and, and just hold in place, wait for the, the temperatures to warm up, which is why... Uh, injecting in the winter time can be pretty hard, uh, depends on your type of tree. And then conversely, when the sun, when it's too hot and the soil is really warm, again, the trees, the, the roots are going to shut down so that they're not losing, uh, they're not getting, going backwards and, and getting pulled, um, getting pulled apart or used up as, um, as a reserve for the carbohydrates that the tree needs to, to produce new, new tissue. So moist soil, good roots are the first two steps on our path to having a, a good uptake day. So moving up out of the soil into the trunk, uh, as a review from last week, best location for injection is between the flare and three feet above the ground. Damaged areas have poor xylem tissue, so just like in that second picture with the big red X, that's missing a large chunk of bark. More than likely, that was caused by some type of mechanical damage, and because of that missing bark, that xylem tissue has been compromised. Uh, it's compartmentalized itself off. So as you can see, the arrows moving around that piece of damaged tissue, uh, that section in the center, it's not going to have any type of conductivity or transporta uh, translocation opportunity. So because you can't excise and really take a look inside the tree um, without damaging it, you want to look for healthy bark. Healthy bark is usually the best indicator of healthy xylem tissue. You can always put in a plug and use a quick jet to see what type of uh, resistance you're getting. Uh, if you do that, try to pump 10 to 15, maybe 20 milliliters of water into that plug. If it goes in, no problem. 
then you can feel pretty confident that the xylem tissue is, is actively trans, translocating water and nutrients from the soil up to the crown, and it should take product in pretty easily. So moving into trunk tissues, uh, what's actually in the trunk, How is it, what's the trunk made up of? Starting with the outside, you have your bark layer that's there for protection, and then uh, your, your phloem, which is what is go, uh, conducts photosynthate, so uh, it brings your sugars that the leaf tissues created through its Kelvin and Krebs cycle. Uh, it's taken that, and that's how it sends all that sugar back down to the roots for storage and use in, in root development. Next layer in is your cambium, uh, vascular cambium. That's living meristematic cells. Uh, it's embryonic, so they're undifferentiated. They're, they're still in development, trying to figure out if they're going to become phloem or xylem tissue. Next layer in is the critical layer when it comes to transporta translocation. That's your uh, outer xylem, a.k.a. sapwood. So that's the functional sapwood. It conducts water, minerals, uh, and when you inject, it conducts your product up to the leaf tissue or uh, up throughout the tree. And then finally, when you get into the center, that's your inner xylem or your heartwood. That's non-functional xylem. It's what all the dark rings that, uh, that, you're, that used to be active xylem, it's what they turn into. It's there for some storage and mainly structural rigidity. So it kind of becomes the... Uh, the pillar that you build around. So again, quick review, bark is there for protection. Phloem is what brings the sugars, your photosynthate, down from the leaf tissue. So that's your downward travel. Vascular cambium is your meristematic tissue, so it's undifferentiated. It's going to become typically either um, phloem or xylem. And new growth can become any type of cell needed for survival. So if it's got to turn into bark because uh, some bark's been ripped out and phloem's there, it'll uh, kind of warn, uh, close off that area and, and become, and you know, it's temporary bark. And then uh, outer xylem for your sapwood, that's your functional stuff. That's where you want to get your product. And then the inner xylem, which is your hardwood, it's there for structural integrity and some storage. So that's your trunk tissue. So we've got uh, good soil moisture, a healthy root zone. We found the, the sapwood, the good, the good section of the xylem, uh, all the way around the tree. We're well on our way to having some good uptake. So looking at how the arbor plug plays into this, um, going over the physiology, now you can kind of really see why you want your arbor plug to sit just below the cambium layer into that outer tissue, that sapwood. That's where your translocation tissue is. It's not farther into the tree. It's not in the bark. Uh, phloem's going to bring it down to the roots, and it's going to get stuck there and not ha do you any good. So if you do that two-step two -step drill method where you go through the bark and inner bark, so the phloem, uh, and then you go five-eighths to two inches of an inch, uh, two inches into your your sapwood, your outer, your outer xylem, and you get your plug in there, that's when you're really going to start seeing better uptake. So again, your properly set arbor plug just below the cambium layer into your outer xylem. Again, regardless of species, product, uh, equipment, depth of drill hole, what type of plug you're using, uh, still just below the cambium layer into that outer xylem. So xylem tissues and translocation, what's the difference between xylem tissues? For those of you that have been, that have done some injection uh, and done it on different types of trees, especially different, a few different types of deciduous and a conifer, uh, you'll, you'll probably have noticed that uptake rates and getting product into the tree varies uh, from tree to tree, even if they're in the same growing condition. That is probably because of their different type of xylem tissue. So there's two main types. There's vessels uh, and tracheids. So vessels are what you find in your hardwoods. Uh, you can either have ring porous tissue, 
uh, ring forest hardwood, which is the left-hand picture with the big holes, or diffuse porous hardwoods, which is that bottom picture uh, where you see the, a lot of smaller dots, not as big as the ring porous, uh, but there's at least a lot of them. And then finally, your tracheids, which you see in your conifers. You can't even see the individual trachea cells because they are that small. Uh, I kind of liken the difference to the ring porous is your McDonald's straw, your diffuse porous is kind of your normal size straw, and then a trachea is a coffee stir. So if you think of your product as a milkshake and the canopy as the mouth sucking the milkshake in, the McDonald's straw, you can actually get that drink in pretty easily. The diffuse porous, that normal size straw, it takes more effort, but you're still going to get some, get some of that milkshake or product in. And then finally, that coffee stir, you're going to work really hard and not get a whole lot of, of, uh, of milkshake up at once. So you have a lot of room, an okay amount of room, very little room. So this is a relative size. This is uh, 200, I believe, microns uh, per uh, for average size. So you can see the ring pores is quite is by uh, a lot by a large margin the largest. Uh, the diffuse pores is about a quarter of that size, and then the trachea is about a tenth of that size. So it gets pretty small pretty quick. Here's some hand drawn. Um, pictures. Some are the uh, ring pores is on the right, so you can see it's a nice fat tube. It's quite long and has uh, a nice open end at the at the at the top and bottom of it where they connect together and basically form one big tube heading up your xylem tissue out to your uh, out to your leaf tissue. They fit together quite nicely. They have uh, you know overlapping ends that that meet up, and, and it works very well together. The diffuse is relatively the same shape. Again, it's about a quarter of the length in, in size, a little bit more narrow. And that's why you can see so many more of them in that other picture. Uh, and they don't make a direct connection. It's not an open end to an open end. It's almost like two sieves that line up to each other. So there's a little bit more resistance in the product moving through. It's not just one connection tube. It's more like a, uh, it turns into more of a, a big tube that also has uh, some filters on the way up. It doesn't actually filter anything up, but it just causes uh, a little bit more energy to be spent moving from one diffuse vessel cell to the next. And to take that to the uh, nth degree is a tracheid. So the tracheids aren't open-ended at all. They uh, almost kind of look like worms that overlap. And it's only the overlapped section that is allowing the product to move up. So again, these are quite a bit smaller, about one-tenth the size of, a, of the ring vessel cell. So you're going to need... Uh, 10 to 15 of those to make up even one of the smaller vessels. But the other problem is, is that there's no open connection, so the water, nutrients, and in our case product that needs to go from one vessel cell or one trachea to the next actually has to pass, actively pass through the cells from one to the next. They don't just move up and through. It's going to actually pass through cell membranes, cell walls, uh, into the next one, and then up. So quite a lot of effort. Looking at a couple cross sections of, you know, a white pine with a ring pores, you can see all those very large uh, ring pores vessel cells, uh, and then a white pine where you're looking at all those little tracheids. And again, if you if we looked at the other angle and could see where those cells line up, there's just a bunch of little holes uh, that, that have cell walls and cell membranes between them that, that the product needs to pass through to keep continuing up, 
and it kind of has to zigzag its way up the tree. Where with that white ash, it basically goes straight up. So again, vessels versus tracheids. Vessels are cells that form long, continuous tubes. Uh, some are perforated, uh, as in the case of the diffuse, um, and some are rings, so they just keep going. They are quite large compared to tracheids. Average length is two to up to six centimeters. So the smaller end, you're looking at your diffuse porous. Uh, the larger end, you're looking at your ring porous. So tracheids, they're single cells that connect. Uh, they're imperforated, so the product or water or nutrients has to actively pass from one cell to another, so through cell membrane, through cell walls, and then through another cell wall and another cell membrane to get inside and then continue to move up. Uh, they're very narrow as well, and their average length is only about one millimeter. So sometimes they can go from being a tenth all the way to uh, one sixtieth of the size. Showing a uh, difference in transpiration rates, this is milliliters per minute of uptake between pine and maple. So the purple is the acer, obviously the maple. Uh, you're looking at 33, almost 34 milliliters per minute moving up through the tree. And in the pine, that, that pinus, you're looking at under 2.4 milliliters per minute. So um, obviously you're going to get a lot more product faster in and up through the uh, through the maple tree than you would the pine, and that's just your typical uh, ring porous tree right there, versus your trachea tree. So along with moving up, there's uh, axial parenchyma, which is lateral, which is cells that run parallel to the growth rings. They're not the actual growth rings, um, but they allow product to move sideways which is how uh, water, nutrients, and product can get by a compartmentalized section of a tree. So that it'd be moving up, uh, you know, in an ash tree up the vessel cells, it hits that compartmentalized, it finds its axial parenchyma, moves sideways until it finds some more active xylem tissue, and then it starts heading up again. And as it heads up, uh, it again spreads out sideways. So the lower on the tree, the injection can get the better because you're going to have more, the product will have more time to move sideways as it moves up throughout the trunk. So again, axial parenchyma cells provide lateral movement of water, nutrients, and in our case, injected product. A long time ago, we did some uh, pictures and cross sections with dyed water into some trees. Uh, so the first picture on the left, you can see that's pretty much right after the injection site. And then uh, as it moves up, you can see the pink starting to move around laterally and moving out throughout the entire outer xylem, uh, all the way through the trunk, uh, through into the branches and crotches, and then finally out into the branches themselves. Uh, you can see that it's, it's all the way out there. You know, those are uh, branches out of the canopy, so you can feel pretty confident that your product's going to get all the way out to the tips. Here's a list of uh, some trees, some of the typical trees that get injected, uh, moving from ring pores to diffuse pores to non porous or tracheids. This list is on the, in the slideshow that's on Litmus, so feel free to download it so you can recognize, uh, you know, have a reference guide. But ash, chestnut, elm, hickory, locust, pin oak, red oak, white oak, uh, they're all ring porous. They're all very easy to inject uh, unless there's weather dependent reasons for your uptake rates to be slow. Uh, diffuse porous, so beech, birches, dogwoods, lindens, live oaks, poplar, sycamore, those are all diffuse, so still pretty easy to get product into, um, but you might see why it's a little bit longer. And then your tracheids, your conifers. So resinous conifers are the ones that provide you the biggest issues because the resin is going to start backfilling those chambers that you've uh, drilled for your plugs almost immediately, uh, especially if you happen to tap one of the, re the, one of the resin uh, deposits. So that's your pine, spruce, Douglas fir, larch, 
and then your non-resinous like hemlocks, firs, and redwoods. So moving into how leaf canopy and transpiration are going to affect your your translocation, to, uh, your trans transpiration rates. So here's your prototypical uh, plant physiology book picture breakdown of leaf tissue. So at the top you have your cuticle, which is basically just a waxy layer there for protection, and then your upper epidermis, which is where you find a lot of your chlorophyll, which is the green pigment. Uh, chlorophyll is mainly uh, is based made out, the base is made out of iron and manganese, which is why uh, if you inject your Minjet FE, so your manganese injectable with iron, uh, that's why you see your green up because it's providing the nutrients that it was unable to take out of the ground uh, for your chlorophyll. Next down below that is your palisade parenchyma. That's where a lot of your uh, Krebs and Calvin cycle processes take place. So the, the chlorophyll is responsible for absorbing the effective light tissue, uh, light waves that help crank up the production levels of your palisade parenchyma. And then inside your spongy parenchyma is where it gets the nutrients, so the building blocks for your um, for your sugars. Inside that, you'll see your vascular bundle, so you have your xylem and phloem all packed nice, to, nice and tightly together to allow for the uh, water and nutrients to come in and your sugars to head out. Your lower epidermis, so made up of the same, you can usually it's a little bit more light green because it doesn't, uh, it's not solely responsible for absorbing sunlight, so it can be a little bit lighter in color, uh, as well as your bottom cuticle, uh, another waxy layer for protection. The difference between the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis, other than the lower epidermis typically being lighter in green, is that there are, is that, that's where your stomata are located with their guard cells. So the guard cells uh, open when they get saturated, and then when they are closed when they get saturated, and then open when they lose, uh, lose some of their water on purpose. So you like them to be open because that's going to allow the gas exchange so your carbon dioxide to come in, oxygen to leave. It's going to allow uh, unused water vapor out, which makes room for the tree to pull more water in, pulling your water nutrients and your injected product up through the xylem tissue. So the leaf is what really regulates your rate of transpiration, which is going to affect your uptake. You can see the arrows. Uh, being basically your CO2 coming in through the guard cells, moving around, uh, getting taken into the spongy layer uh, and your palisade layer, uh, m working on your product uh, and, or not your product, but making the sugars and photosynthates necessary to, to keep the tree growing. So when stomata are open, transpiration can occur. That is going to allow oxygen and water vapor to escape, creating room inside the tree and a pull effect to move water and nutrients from the roots up through the tree into your leaf tissue. So this draws water and nutrients up your xylem tissue, and when you inject, it carries that product with it. When the stomata are closed, transpiration is severely limited. So there's nowhere, there's nowhere for water and nutrients to go when they're closed. Uh, so there's no action pulling it up. It's the tree's no longer losing something and needing to replace it. So when your stomates close, that shuts off your the escape for the water vapor, shutting off your transpiration rates. So why does stomata tend to close? One, darkness. If there's no sunlight, there's no action inside the leaf, so they shut down to prevent loss of any excess water. Higher low air temperatures, so when the temperature gets too hot, the tree uh, sweats basically through letting water vapor out, uh, pulling more in, but it also understands the internal balance of 
having enough water to stay to survive. So when it realizes it's losing more air, uh, losing more water than pulling in, it shuts its stomates to keep the tree to keep itself from wilting and drying out. Low air temperatures slow all the processes down, so it doesn't need the stomates open as not as much because it's not processing everything as fast as it could. Uh, poor soil moisture, again, that goes back to possibly more than likely losing more water out of the stomates than bringing in, so it's going to shut them so that it doesn't wilt. Relatively high humidity, so if the water vapor is trying to move into the air, but the air is saturated because it's got a high humidity level, then your stomates will close because it doesn't have anywhere to go and it would rather not allow excess water into the leaf tissue because that could cause fungal diseases. Still air. Um, you can always feel, like typically when you're outside, you'll feel that uh, still humid air feels a lot worse than moving humid air. Uh, so at least if the air is moving, then, it, then it's got a little bit more space for water vapor to enter. Falling temperatures, if it's getting colder out, again, processes are slowing down, so it needs to lose less, or it needs to bring in less water, which means it's not losing as much water on the other end, so they can close so that they're not losing too much. And if the internal leaf tissue has a high concentration of CO2 and a low concentration of oxygen, uh, it doesn't need to keep the stomates open to let any more CO2 in because it's got uh, a plethora of it and it needs to actually work down its overabundance before needing any more. So obviously the opposite of when they tend to be open is light out. So uh, your epidermis is absorbing light tissue. Uh, your palisade parenchyma are going through their processes. Uh, moderate air temperatures. So uh, for trees, it's mainly 55 up to about 80. When it gets below or below 55, it's usually getting too cool, and they start slowing down, so they shut. When it gets above 80, uh, unless there's been ample, ample soil moisture, uh, they're going to start sh uh, shutting down as well so they don't dry out. Again, good soil moisture, so enough water that the tree has something to drink but not so much that it's fully consumed everything and it's full. Uh, low relative humidity, so there's plenty of room for that water vapor to leave the tissue and go into the air. Uh, windy, or at least a breeze, that way uh, the air is always moving and can always take that water vapor that's coming out of leaf tissue and take it somewhere. Uh, rising temperature, so getting into that 55 to 80 degree range. Uh, and if there's low carbon dioxide and a high oxygen level inside the leaf, it needs to keep that balanced. It needs to keep bringing in fresh CO2 to get the carbon so that it can make its, its sugars. So now understanding stomata uh, and how that is affected by moderate temps, air, you know, the air quality, uh, so we have now uh, nice moist soil, a good root system. We found the correct xylem tissue to put the product in, uh, and we have uh, acceptable environmental conditions. We're almost all the way to good uptake. And finally, the last thing is the canopy. So you have all that all that stuff going on in the leaf tissue. Now you need a large volume of that leaf tissue to keep it all going. So you can see healthy leaf tissue, like a healthy looking canopy on the left and a couple of those other pictures, especially that before and after, you can see those are the same, uh, the same type of tree. One's obviously in a lot better shape than the other. Uh, the tree on the right is quite chlorotic. Uh, it's probably missing iron, manganese. Uh, can't get it from the soil for one reason or another. Uh, the tree on the right, I believe, has been injected with Minjet FE, so it made up for it, and now it's healthy. All those leaves are up and running. Uh, the tissue's open and bringing in more carbon dioxide and letting water vapor out, bringing in more water and nutrients from the soil. And then the same thing up top, the, uh, you know, a good-looking canopy in the center and then a horrible-looking canopy on the right. Uh, 
as these canopies keep thinning out, you're losing the ability to have uh, leaf tissue, losing your, your transpiration abilities. So now we have good canopy to go along with the moisture, so you have water in the soil that can get pulled into the tree, roots to pull that water in, healthy xylem to move it up to the canopy, moderate temps to allow the leaf tissue to do its job, and a lot of leaf tissue and a healthy canopy. So you put those five things together and you should have some good uptake on those days. Uh, just a little look at water movement in tree and why some of those reasons that stomate, for the stomates to be open are applicable. Uh, water likes to move from a place of higher pressure to lower pressure. Um, roots have high pressure. They're lower, one, they're lower to and in, in the ground, where the higher you go up in the atmosphere, the thinner it gets, so there's less atmospheric pressure. So when the stomates are open, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure at the leaf tissue is quite a bit lower than the atmospheric pressure in the soil, in the roots. So that water is going to, one, get pushed up, but also is going to get pulled out because of the trees feeling the environmental need to balance itself. So it's going to keep going until the leaf says, no, I need to shut down for one of any of those reasons, whether it's losing too much water, it's getting dark, um, the atmospheric pressure up by the leaf tissue is high, uh, so it's approaching closer to the soil. It'll shut down uh, because nothing's going out. <coughs> Excuse me. A uh, little quick review of post-injection tissue response. So again, compartmentalization is a natural process that the tree uses to deal with damaged areas. Trees have been around for who knows how many years, millennia, if not more. Um, dealing with damage from insects, animals, diseases, uh, you know, in the last 500, 600 years, humans either hitting them with something, uh, cutting them down, causing some type of issue. So compartmentalization is how trees adapted to deal with it. <clears throat> so you can see in these pictures all the compartmentalized areas, uh, whether that's from just above or below injection sites uh, or just drill holes, but you can see all that darker tissue is where your compartmentalized tissue is, so that's the shut off area, and then obviously healthy tissue growing outside of it. So what heals faster, broken or cut limbs? Uh, obviously, the broken limbs heal slower because they have all that space that they got to fill in. Uh, you can see the big X on the right uh, with a big cavity behind it. Uh, boring insects, uh, you know, those typical D-shaped holes, or drill sites for arborplex. All cause wounds, all get compartmentalized. So factors affecting uptake, uh, this is up on the, in the slideshow that's on litmus as well, uh, and it goes from slow uptake to medium uptake to faster uptake on the top, and then down the left-hand side is why your, uh, is reasons for giving each of those types of uptake. So whether it's your season and it's winter, midsummer, or spring or early fall, uh, environmental conditions, your product and chemistry, or injection sites, number of injection sites. So that concludes the tree physiology portion. I know this one's pretty long, uh, but again, there's a lot to understand about physiology and how it relates to trunk injection. So if anyone has any questions, uh,